I would therefore suggest that let's reorder our priorities in life. Make use of this great equipment, the great power of intuition that has been given to us. Use it in conjunction with the coincidences of life and use the powerful means of reason and our brain power to implement them and carry them out and see if we can make our relationships better, our life better. My friends who have tried this have given me the nod when I asked them, did it work? They said, yes. In my case, it worked. I hope in your case, it will also work. Thank you very much for your patience in listening to me and thank you very much for your patience in waiting for me. I got stuck in the way for a while. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You, you spoke a lot about meditation and uh, from my own experience, and I want to know if this is right about this. Do you think meditation is a tool that we can use to sort of clear all the junk out of the way from our in intuition? Um, more likely to uh, appear? Yes. Any other question? Yes. Uh, assuming that the same condition exists, can one have an intuitive flash that will explain something along with another person who has an intuitive flash that's just contrary, yet they both have this flash, this flash of intuition over the same condition or the same problem? They follow their own intuition because the problems we have in life do not have a single solution. And each individual has his or her own solution. We follow our own intuition. Then we go like the, the ladder. When do we reach the place where there's no longer any need of intuition, where we just have the knowledge? Uh, when we transcend the mental region, right now we are in a physical region. Our self is embedded in a physical body. When we transcend this into the next wakeful state, we get into a sensory body without any physical matter. That's the first stage. When we transcend that, we go into a causal body, which is the mind only, the mental processes with no sensory perceptions and no physical bodies. When we transcend that into pure spirit, we don't need any, any of this distinction between uh, reason and intuition. We know everything. In the traditional literature, they call that the par Brahm stage. The Brahm stage being the top of the mental stage and Par Brahm being the beyond Brahm. That's where all knowing, uh, knowing is natural and automatic. Yes? You yes. were talking some about dreams and you talked about illusion. Is, um, can dreams, can things come to you in dreams, you know, guide you or anything that you're in dreams? Is that yourself? Yes. We regard any experiences different than our wakeful experience that occurs in sleep as a dream. But dreams are of many kinds. There are some dreams that are a lower level of illusion than the wakeful state. There are some dreams that are of the same level of illusion as the wakeful state. There are some dreams that are of a higher level of reality than even the wakeful state. So it depends upon the dream. The general distinction is if a dream is monocolor, generally in buff color, skin color, all the things appear in that color, it's a lower level of dream, does not give you any guidance. If a dream is technicolor with blues and yellows visible in it, these colors, it's generally of a kind where guidance can be obtained. And if a dream makes you feel you are woken up, it's a still higher kind of dream. So it depends on the type of dream and which gives you guidance. Yes? Why do you call it a wakeful state or state of illusion? Because there is a higher wakeful state in reference to which this looks like an illusion. If this wakeful state were the top of wakefulness, then I wouldn't call it illusion. But since there are higher wakeful states, and not one, but several levels, therefore, each lower level looks like an illusion and a dream in relation to the higher wakeful state. Yes? I woke up with it somewhere. It was the trouble with the mind, probably the, the receptors and senders, and only, like God says, I am, and I'd be the only one that could say, how do we know that all this is in the mind, that this is all out? There in the I am. Uh, when we use the word I am, the word I am is a paraphrase of the word self. I am is the self. There is no other self except God. There is no other conscious being in the final reality except God. And that final being alone then creates the illusions of the many. 
and the I am continues the many, so that the many should be looking like, acting like the self. And therefore, as this devolution of illusions takes place, the I am appears to get divided into a large creation of living things and living beings. But the I am is still one. It's never changed. How do we find out that this is not merely a speculation, but actually the I am is the only one God I am, is to success, successively wake up from stage to stage till you wake up to the final stage of only one I am. And that's what the mystics teach. Mystics and the masters teach us how to awaken to higher reality, level after level till you find that ultimately what you called a separate God was I am, was the same self. There is no other way of checking out except by personal experience. Every other method of checking out is only a palliative for the intellect. At best, it is, it is a device to be used to keep the intellect in hold, not to object while we experiment. If any other philosophical conjecture appeals to us, it is good, oh, look, sound, that appeals to me, that's logical, that's good. Use it to hold the mind in restraint while you experiment with your own self and find the truth. But the truth is only found by experience. Anybody else? To offer a comment or anybody wanting to define the tiger or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> but could you explain? <coughs> I have heard so many interpretations of this good old saying, I am that I am. Could, could you expand on what that is really supposed to mean? I've heard so many different ideas on that. The expression I am is taken from the realization or the truth that there is only one being that exists. And that is I am, which means there is nothing else except I am, the so one being alone exists with nothing else. Starting from this premise, I am, if there's only one I am, who are we the rest? What is this rest of this world? So we start from the periphery and say, if there's only one who is the I am, what is this periphery? So the periphery we start analyzing, where does it originate from, come from, and we find it's an extension, a function of the I am. And as we rise in knowledge, eventually we find that it was the same I am. Therefore, we say, I am that I am. Ultimately, we find, now let's say in a, in a more uh, uh, rationally acceptable language that the I am we talk of, or God or creator we talk of, is totality of consciousness. Let's say, because we understand that this awareness we have, which makes us exist, we can look out, we can be, because we are conscious. Let us assume that what is making us conscious is real. If you start from that point and say, the totality of this consciousness, wherever it exists, must be God. If you start from that point, that totality of consciousness is only one, cannot be broken, cannot be split, cannot be divided, is only one and the only thing existing, then all the others must exist as something that that consciousness is conscious of. If that consciousness becomes conscious of another, there will be no other. That other is the extension of that consciousness because it chose to be conscious of that. If that be so, then the other will be a creation. We might as well say it's a creation or it's something of which that consciousness chose to be conscious of. The word creation has been used in that sense. That when the single consciousness, the only consciousness, the only consciousness that ever existed, ever will exist and is ever existing, one, when that one chose to be conscious of another, that other was an illusion, but it became creation because it wouldn't be there but for that one consciousness. And that one consciousness assumed the title of creator because it had a creation. Now, if that one consciousness assumes there are many consciousnesses, those many consciousnesses are creation. They don't exist, but they function like the one consciousness and they are still functioning within that one consciousness because that one consciousness assumed and chose to be many consciousnesses. It didn't divide. This exercise took place within that one. Supposing the devolution goes on like this and a huge multi-populated world comes into being, it's still one consciousness. In that one consciousness, when we look at it here and somebody tells us this mysterious secret, 
Because there's a very mysterious secret. We meet here and we are all assuming, we are all separate consciousnesses, we are all separate beings, we dress differently, we talk differently, we live differently, and here we are comparing notes. We can talk to each other. How can there be one consciousness? But we heard from the wise people, there's only one. Now we want to reconcile it. Say, how did we come into being? How are we here? We are here because we are aware of us being here. We are conscious of us being here. If we were not, we would not be here. There may be a person standing here we are not conscious of, so he's not here. We are only having that creation, that manifestation, that existence of what you are conscious. Of what we are not conscious is not there. Therefore, starting from the point that we wouldn't be here if we were not conscious of being here, our existence is depending upon our consciousness of being here. Okay, if that is so, maybe we are not here, we are just conscious of being here. And that makes us look like we are here. If that is so, maybe that then this is all being done by some one grand player. Now, this is, this is a, to make it a short story. But if you do meditational exercise and withdraw to those levels of consciousness, which are the opposite of the devolution of the many, and go towards the one, eventually you find that is the one. And who was that one? The self was the one. And who is the self? Whoever is experiencing the self. Is there anybody experiencing the self right now? Please raise your hands if you feel you are the self. We all are. But then, are you experiencing that you are the self and the other person is also the self? Anybody feeling that somebody else is also the self? Who else is the self? We all are the self. But when we experience the self in us, individuated, we cannot experience the individual, individuated self in anyone else. Either you can say all self or one self. You can't say in this group there are two selves. You can never say that. Either there is one or all. All because it is one spread into a picture, a creation of all. So sometimes this can be a little confusing for a beginner who wants to seek God. And he is told, well, ultimately, first of all, you will find you lose all your friends. You will find you are the only one. Secondly, you will be very lonely. There is no one else, real. If you want to go into reality, you will find in reality there is only one. But that gives a clue to why we are so many. If reality is one, there is a very good basis for creating the many. If reality truly is one, it's the best basis you could have for creating the many. What would be the characteristics of that one? It would have everlasting peace. There is nothing to break it when there is only one. You never have broken peace where there is only one. If on this earth all people were destroyed, only one lived, there will be no wars, there will be all peace all the time. You need more than one to have aggression to break the peace. If then truth, if the reality is that there is only one, it has to be very peaceful, full of love and joy because there is no one to separate. All one union. All yoga is complete there. So this oneness gives love, joy, happiness, all the attributes we give to God. So God has all the attributes, but one attribute we shy away, we don't tell people. God has got all this and we say, he is lonely. We don't say that. Why? Before, because before we could say it, he already created the many and got good company for himself. So there is a very good justification for the whole show as it stands. In fact, even as the best architect, if you are a real good architect and wanted to construct a new creation of your own will with your own imagination, freed from any inhibition. Say, I want to make a perfect creation, starting from the assumption you are only one, one total consciousness. And you can create an illusion of a big world, endless world. You can try this combination. It has some faults. It's not so good. This one, you'll be amazed when you come to this. This one which is there is the best. It's amazing. This one that is there is the best because it includes all the elements that you can create. And if you see a part of this creation, it's terrible. If you see the other part, it's terrible. This part looks terrible and therefore there's hope the other one is better. But the totality of it is perfect. So if one can experience, not only intellectually understand, but experience how one consciousness, the only reality, can create a beautiful illusion for itself of the many, the many splendid universes, many splendid regions of consciousness. It can create all that 
and they all fit beautifully into perfection. You can't touch it for improvement. That's what the creator has done. I have not seen anybody who can make a good suggestion to improve it. You can improve one section of it, which messes up all the rest of it. But if you want to see the totality of it, it's the perfect. Of course, people ask me, why should God create pain? Why should he create darkness, ignorance, cruelty, crime, sickness, misery? Why should he create these things? How do they fit into perfection? The answer is, these are the very things that make their opposite states desirable. If there was no darkness, nobody would ever appreciate light. Nobody would even know there is light. Leave aside. You wouldn't get consciousness. In time and space, in the region in which we are, it is impossible to know anything except from the opposite. Everything created in this world of duality, in this world of time, space, and causation rests for consciousness upon its opposites. When you have opposites, then you know, oh, this exists because the other exists. Take one away, the other goes away automatically. So therefore, we have this combination of darkness and light, and the darkness makes us see light. Supposing there was light of a certain kind all the time in our life, whether we close our eyes, open our eyes, go to sleep, wake up, walk, talk, do anything that light is there, we would never see it. Maybe it is there right now. We never saw it. Because there is no, no way to see it except in relation to when it is missing. And the opposite is there. So this uh, perfection of this region of experience, this beautiful region of experience in which that one consciousness brought down that one unique feature which I mentioned to you last night, that unique feature that travels all the way down, the feature of the self. It's the same self, that same one seems to be in the center of any creation. Go to the next one, same self. Third one, same self. Come right down here, same self with a plus. In between, it is the same self with the knowledge and awareness. When it comes to the physical plane of a human being, when the human being came, he was the most akin creation to that one. That means man is the closest in likeness to God. He may have created angels and gods and heavens full of so many other beings and entities of higher order, always happy, always dancing, always laughing, but they miss something which man in this physical creation has got from God at the top. The one God has given that one thing to man here and that is free will. I can decide, let me change my plans. God can change plans and man can change plans and nobody else can. They are all programmed to go according to creation. The only two beings who exist and want to change plans are either the ultimate creator whose will, whose wish, whose consciousness, whichever form it takes makes creation. And a human being at this gross level of the physical world who says, maybe I can make my own plans. I don't think this is right. I should do what I like. I don't like this. I like this. I want to go this way, not this way. And tries to go this way. And his own real self, the totality, enjoys this. Because that's why the totality made this. Enjoys how much reality has been injected into the deepest level of illusion. One of the things that makes this physical world look so real is free will. Supposing you had all the other, all the other elements of this creation but not free will, it wouldn't look so real. Free will makes it so real, you can't question it. In fact, that one consciousness looks unreal, as if it is a God removed from us. But we are more real. So we can create our gods whenever we like. We can have a concept of a God, we can change our gods, we can defend our own God, we can fight and kill people for our own God. We have got so much reality into this form of existence because of the transmittal of that unique privilege which either the one consciousness has or we have. Nobody else has. So the Eastern mystics have called the human form as the top of creation. They say there are many forms of creation at higher levels of consciousness. None matches with the human form for this very reason of free will. The illusion of free will is the best illusion created. All the other illusions fall inferior, are inferior to this illusion that we have free will and therefore we are responsible for what we do. Therefore we can do what we like. It's a grand illusion. It's the grandest illusion ever created because the grandness of the illusion is when I decide I am going to tap this microphone, you say I have no free will, here I've tapped it. How can you say I have no free will? That's the grandest illusion. 
the grandness of the illusion comes in the fact when I did this, the one consciousness did it. And I didn't know that. That's where the grandness of the illusion is. Therefore, the last laugh is always had by the one consciousness. His will alone prevails. And we think ours prevailed. And therefore, the show is excellent. If you look at it from the point of view of the one consciousness, this is the most wonderful show ever set up. It's difficult to improve it. Yes. Yes. Just to give a twist to your talk, when I was looking at the title of today's speech, a thought crossed my mind. And since coming from an Indian background, there is a goddess in India strikes the tiger. So I thought probably you might try to talk about that. So my question is, do you have any comments about it? Yes, the first. The first comment is that you should have told me before the beginning of my talk. <laughs> the second comment is, when driving to this place, I was thinking of talking about the goddess Durga riding the tiger. And then I said that, that will limit the scope of this talk. But uh, there is a goddess in India, the goddess of uh, power, uh, who rides the tiger. And uh, that goddess has been experienced by people through yogic practices as one of the goddesses of Shakti. Shakti or power has been expressed in many forms of goddesses. In fact, in the uh, pantheology of Indian gods and goddesses, there is uh, the goddess has been given the highest place. In the different energy centers in the human body, you, many of you are uh, exposed to yoga, Patanjali is Raj Yoga or Hat Yoga or other forms of yoga where the different chakras are described. And the chakras which start from the bottom and come up all the way up to the eye center, the six chakras, in that the, the god of wish fulfillment or Ganesh or the elephant god is at the bottom. Brahma the creator comes next. Vishnu the sustainer comes in the navel. Shiva the destroyer comes at the heart region. All these are male gods in the pantheology. But the goddess Durga or Kali or any female goddess who comes in our pantheology comes at the throat level, just below the self which comes behind the eyes. So the goddess has been given this importance. I don't know if women have been treated in the same way as the goddesses in pantheology, uh, but sometimes the women have claimed their right to be treated like that from the religious lore. There this goddess rides a tiger and the story is that uh, when you ride a tiger, you have all the power of the tiger till you get off. You can't get off once you ride a tiger. So that symbol of Durga, the goddess riding the tiger as a symbol of power exists while she is on the tiger. So she can never be separated from the tiger. Thank you for suggesting that I share this. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. There's another tiger. There's a paper tiger too. And we're all buried in papers. The more papers we have to do, it. some of us ride that and we can't get off either. <laughs> That's right. The, uh, I worked for government <laughs> bureaucracy, and I remember we used to uh, we used to in committees say the real reason for slow progress of bureaucracy. The real reason, and and that's not only for Indian bureaucracy where I worked, the United Nations too, which exposed me to the uh, U.S. bureaucracy, and I found all bureaucracies by nature of their accountability write a lot more than is needed to be written because of the accountability. Who is responsible? Keep a record. So they want to write a lot more than is necessary for taking the agency or the corporation or the body organization forward. The problem was that we used to write so much and then say we shouldn't write. The most interesting uh, meetings that I attended were when we said, write out a report, how we can cut out on paper. And another paper would come with that report and would add on to that. <laughs> And then here also I found that uh, uh, to reduce paperwork, commissions have been set up and more reports have come up and more paper jammed up. So I agree, the paper tiger uh, has, uh, people have been riding on the paper tiger for a long time. Thank you for the suggestion. Anybody else want to share about the tiger? Yes. Oh, I just want to ask uh, a question about karma. The reaction to karma always takes place in or the action and reaction always take place on the same level, or do they sometimes the reaction come from a different level? Different levels also. Mostly same place, but sometimes in different levels. For example, she asked me about a dream. Many 
karmas of real life can be reacted and paid off or reap reward of in dream and vice versa. Yes. Evolution. Can we evolve beyond karma into grace? Yes. When we, karma is a mental situation where there's no mind, there is no karma. So long as we are acting in the domain of the mind, the mind alone creates the time space sequence this following that. So if there is no this following that, there can be no karma. When we transcend Brahma and go into Par Brahm, which is the spiritual stage, there is no karma. One who can transcend that has transcended karma. Karma doesn't affect. Well, thank you very much for the patience you have shown and I am very happy to come here again and meet many friends, new friends and old friends. Hope to come again sometime and see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.